The Lord has impressed upon my heart a message. As you all know, usually we've been uh, teaching and preaching this message on Christ, our righteousness. It's a message that the pen of inspiration said that we truly, 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 truly need to understand and we need to have an experience of. So today I will talk a little about the faith of Jesus and what that, that means to us and how does it relate to Christ and his righteousness. So as we go into the world, let us all pray together that the Lord will speak to us concerning this message. Let's pray. Father, we come before your presence even now to hear from you. Lord, we want to hear from no one else but you. So Lord, we ask you to take control of this room, of the atmosphere, of the system. Hide me behind the cross. Lay my glory in the dust and do for each and every one of us something that we are incapable of doing for ourselves. Lord, speak to us, dear Father, through your Holy Spirit. Let Jesus be heard and him crucified. And Lord, help, O oh God, that as we have listened, that we only will not be listeners or hearers of the word, but the word will be our lives. Thank you, in Jesus' name. message is entitled the faith of Jesus. Now when we talk about faith most of us as Adventists our mind quickly go to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 yes. right which declares now faith is the substance, substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. Does that really explain to us what faith is? You know it it, it, it sound kind of convoluted. You know, the faith is the substance. Substance means something tangible, right? Something you could touch. And then it says, the, you know, the, the substance of things hope for the evidence of things not seen. And evidence is usually something you can see, right? Yes. And so to combine the two, you know, this seems to be a prescription of what faith looks like. So it's always something tangible, even when you can't see it. Amen? Now verse 3 of the same chapter of the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things that which do appear. Are we catching that? So, so verse 3 says, through faith, right? We understand that the worlds were framed or made by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Can you see my word? Can you see my word? Let me ask that again. Right. But you can hear my word. But here it is saying the world were framed by the word of God. So that the tree, the moon, the star, the sky that now appear was made by things that we cannot see, which is the word of God. Are you getting that? And you know what is impressive about this, that by faith we believe that God spoke all these things in existence. We believe that through the word of God, everything that we are now seeing, the grass, the tree, that which now appears is through his word. And the very sun 
You don't ask a question if when you get up tomorrow, the sun will be in the sky, right? But almost 6,000 years, we have been on this earth, but still yet, the word of God has sustained the sun in the sky. That's the power of God's word. Are you listening to me? The word continues to say in verse 6, and it highlights, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must do what? Believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. So we must believe that he exists. And more than existing, that he is also a benefactor of them that diligently seek him. So, so let us look at the word faith. Let us break it down, simplify it for the little ones and everybody, right? Faith is defined as, number one, confidence or trust in a person or thing. What did I say? Faith is defined as confidence or trust in a person or thing. And you explain confidence with, with for instance, a child, say, little Naomi, right? She loved her daddy so much. And if her daddy stands uh, uh, somewhere and said, Naomi, you're there, jump. Jump in daddy's arms. Naomi wouldn't question it. Why? Because she trusts and has confidence that her daddy would not allow anything to happen to her. So she would just leave. Are you listening to me? So that is what faith is. So faith is confidence and trust in a person or thing. The second definition says faith is belief that is not based on proof. Belief that is not based on proof. Right? Now, we believe that God has already proved by creating all that he has created. So we do understand that through the word of God, the words were faith. So, so based on that, we already have proof in the power of his word. And though we are not able to see some of the things we are going to go through that we need now to trust in his word and him, we don't have the evidence that these things will happen, but we have faith in his ability to come through for us. What do you say? So belief that is not based always on proof, right? The third definition here, the application of loyalty or fidelity to a person, promise, or engagement. So here now it is on the faithfulness, right? Having confidence in the faithfulness of somebody who now is making an obligation to be loyal to you, to be uh, uh, faithful to you, and to make a promise to you. So you are now having trust or confidence in somebody's obligation of loyalty or fidelity or promise or engagement to a person. Are we together? So do we have a little better understanding of what faith is now? Do we? Well, if you don't, let us look at a biblical example. Amen? So I want to turn your Bible, I want you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew, the 8th chapter, verses 5 to 13. Now we're going to look on the story of the centurion. You are very familiar with that story. Amen? Here in the book of Matthew, the 8th chapter, you have this centurion who had a servant that was grievously ill. Let us look at the story. Matthew 8, 5, 13. Are you there? Amen. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching, begging him. Verse 6 says, And saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Verse 7 says, And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. But speak the word only. Do what? Speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this, go, this man go, and he goeth. And to another come, and he cometh. And to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he did what? Marveled. 
and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. No, 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 why he said Israel? He could say in the world, or he could say with the Gentiles, but, but what he said, Israel. Why? Because they were expected to be faithful people, people of faith, right? But there he's saying to this Gentile man that he has shown greater faith than believers. Could he be speaking to us today? Are there people in the world today showing more faith in God and his ability to be faithful to them than believers or professed believers? Mercy. And the word continued to say, that and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of feet. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And this and his servant was healed in the same self are we now getting the gist of what faith is, beloved? It's not just the idea of we're thinking the, 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 the substance of things, oh, but we are actually seeing that substance and the evidence of things not seen there. So how does faith occur? I mean, we see how we exercise faith, right? We see how faith is being exercised. How does it occur? The book of Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 17 says, So then faith cometh by what? Hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In the case of the centurion, he heard the word concerning the ministry of Jesus, and it invoked confidence and trust or faith, in what he heard surrounding the ministry of Jesus, which involved the healing of the sick, the raising of the dead, the blind to see, the lame to walk, and so on. This ministry that this centurion heard about, it led him to believe completely in Jesus. So he who is a man of authority knows that when he gives instruction to his authority, those who receive it follow in his instruction without questioning him. And here now we see somebody who is supernaturally able to heal the sick, let the lame walk again, the blind to see. This has to be a man of authority. What do you say? So he said, I am not a man that is is following you and following God or religious or spiritual? I, I'm really a, an unjust man. I'm really an unholy man. And I can't have a man like you in my presence, in my home. So hear what? Speak the word. Yes. You have that authority. I've heard about that authority through your ministry. Speak the word. I know by you speaking the word with the authority that you hold, my servant will be healed. This is why Jesus said that man, some will come from the east and the west and, 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 and they will inherit the kingdom over you and you will be cast out because of lack of confidence in the word of God. Lack of trust in Jesus. Now, we knew that the, the centurion wasn't just basing his faith on a figment of his imagination. He heard and may have met some of those who met Jesus' healing. John 20 verse 30 and 31 also give evidences of what makes us believe. John 20 verse 30 and 31 says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these these are written, meaning the ones that we are talking about, the lame walk, the blind see, the dead raised, all these are written that he might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing he might have life through his name. So, so we have the biblical record and evidence of the ministry of Jesus Christ. 
It was A.T. Jones in the book Lessons on Faith, page 23 to 24, that spoke something about faith. He says, Therefore, the word of God is the only means of faith. Therefore, where there is no word of God, there cannot be any faith. And where the word of God is, faith is entire dependence upon that word for the accomplishment of what that word says. You want me to read it again? This is what A.T. Jones says. Therefore, the word of God is the only means of faith. It is the only thing that truly invokes an ability to trust and have confidence. Therefore, where there is no word, and the word here is in uppercase W, by the way, of God, there cannot be any faith. And where the word of God is, faith is entire dependence upon that word for the accomplishment of what that word says it will do. Now the word continued to tell us, beloved, that Jesus is that word. Are you listening to me? It's not just something that is written in black and white, but it's something that is coming from a being that is full of love and affection. Jesus is the Word. John 1, 1 to 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2 says, The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, his character, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the word. Beloved, when you take up this Bible, we are holding in our hand Jesus Christ, the words of Jesus Christ. Are you listening to me? Yes. If you didn't believe that Psalms 40, verse 7 and 8 says, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. Delight, I, I delight to do thy will, oh my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. So here, the, the psalmist was basically prophesying of what Jesus was saying. That he came in the volume of the entire book. So from Genesis to Revelation, is speaking about who? Jesus Christ. Because he is the word. Are we together, beloved? John 5, 39 says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. Now Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, and who knew the word more than the Pharisees? Who knew the scriptures more than seven Adventists? Who know about the, the, the doctrines of the truth of the Bible more than seven Adventists? And so here Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees, speaking to seven Adventists, when he said, You've been searching the scriptures, acquiring knowledge about doctrines. Acquiring knowledge. For in them you think you have eternal life. But I'm telling you today, these words are they that talks about me. Yes. So if you have all that knowledge about the word which is speaking about me, because I am in the bottom of the book fully, and you are not reflecting me, then who it is that you are studying about? So what concerning the faith of Jesus or the faithfulness of Jesus that generates or invokes faith in any man. What is it? Romans 1, 16 and 17 talks a little about it and it's very specific as to what it is. Romans 1, 16 and 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For theory, meaning in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. In other words, from his faithfulness to your faith is revealed the right doing of God. So in that gospel, in the gospel, is revealed the right doing or the righteousness of God. And this is revealed from his faithfulness 
to our believing in his faithfulness or trusting in his faithfulness. And the word continues to say, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now we talk about keeping God's commandment. We talk about doing God's will. And if there is no keeping of God's commandment, there is no doing of God's will without faith. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 3 kind of expounds a little more on what this gospel is. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and where ye stand, by which also ye are saved. In other words, by the very same gospel which you are saved. If you keep this very gospel in memory, what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For verse 3 says, For I have delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Paul says, How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So the gospel here, in a nutshell, is speaking about Jesus' death for our sins. And here Paul is saying, There is power in that gospel, in the knowledge, in knowing about Jesus dying for your sins. Are you listening to me? There is power if we don't believe the word of God. The Bible says, well, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And the gospel speak about Jesus dying for our sins. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Still yet we are powerless. Why is it that we are powerless? Is it because we are, we are not trusting in, 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 in the gospel? Is it because we are not trusting and having confidence in the fact that Jesus died for our sins? How we don't believe it. How we are doubting it. Now let me share some insight from the pen of inspiration, the book Desires of Ages, page 759 to 760, where Jesus where Sister White spoke in more details about this gospel. Now listen. The pen of inspiration says this. All heaven and the unfallen worlds had been witnesses to the controversy. With what intense interest did they follow closely scenes of the conflict? They beheld the Savior enter the Garden of Gethsemane. His soul bowed down with the horror of a great darkness. They heard his bitter cry, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. As the Father's presence was withdrawn, they saw him sorrowfully with a bitterness of sorrow exceeding that of the last great struggle with death. The bloody sweat was forced from his pores and fell in drops upon the ground. Thrice the prayer for deliverance was wrong from his lips. Heaven could no longer endure the sight, and a messenger of comfort was sent to the Son of God. Heaven beheld the victim, betrayed into the hands of the murderous mob, and with mockery and violence hurried from the one tribunal to another. He heard the sneers of his persecutors because of his lowly birth. It heard the denial with cursing and swearing by one of his best loved disciples. He saw the frenzied work of Satan and his power over the hearts of men. Oh, fearful scene. The Savior sees that midnight in Gethsemane dragged and fro, dragged to and fro from place to place, palace to palace. Judgment hall to judgment hall. Arraigned twice before the priest, twice before the Sanhedrin, twice before Pilate, once before Herod. Mocked, scourged, condemned, and led out to be crucified. Bearing the heavy burden of the cross. Amid the wailing of the daughters of Jerusalem and the jeering of the rabble. Heaven. The darling of heaven. We're talking about the gospel. We're talking about Jesus. The sacrifice for all humanity. We're talking about the Savior for his enemy. Heaven viewed with grief and amazement. Christ hanging upon the cross. Blood flowing 
from his wounded temples and sweat tinged with blood standing upon his brow. From his hands and feet the blood fell, drop by drop upon the rock, drilled for the foot of the cross. The wounds made by the nails gaped as the weight of his body dragged upon his hands. His labored breath grew quick and deeper as his soul panted under the burden of the sins of the world. All heaven was filled with wonder when the prayer of Christ was offered in the midst of his terrible suffering, not for himself, by the way. Father, I can imagine as, as, as I picture and as we go to that very scene of Golgotha, beloved, I can imagine he can hardly speak. He had to, to, to prop himself up to say a word. For they know not what they do. Yet there stood men formed in the image of God, joining to crush out the life of his only begotten Son. What a sight for the heavenly universe. We, we cannot imagine, beloved, unless you think about your own child. When someone ripped from your arms, your loving arms, and takes and sacrifices, then we'll have a, 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 a mere understanding of what the Father went through in a separation from His Son. We're talking about the faith of Jesus. Not our faith. Not our flimsy faith. Our faith is really an arm that receives everything the darling of heaven has done for us. John 5, 30, 31 continues to describe Jesus and that faith of Jesus. I can of myself, the Bible says in John 5, 30, 31, I can of mine own self do nothing. See, Jesus took on sinful flesh. He took on flesh. He, he didn't have all the grandeur and splendor of all that divinity. He took on our flesh. Was made in likeness of us. Bore sin in the flesh, but condemned sin in the flesh. So he made it I can of mine own self do nothing. This is Jesus speaking. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Are we seeking our own will, beloved? And saying we are followers of Jesus? He said, I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father that sent me. Are we questioned when we make these decisions in our own life? Am I satisfying the will of the Father? Or am I satisfying my own selfish desires? My own selfish will. He continued to say, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Are we bearing witnesses of our own lives? Are we telling the people, our friends, our family, our co-workers, our neighbors, of our own accomplishment? Or are we showing them the accomplishment of Jesus on behalf of all humanity? Whose accomplishment are we putting before the world? Our own? Hebrews 12, 2 and 3 talks again about this faith of Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of whose faith? Our faith. Who for the joy, for the what? For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest he be weary and faint in your minds. In other words, 
as you go through your own experience and you think you're going to too much you think that your burden is too great you think your cross is so heavy consider Jesus consider what he been through at least you deserve and I deserve to be on that cross the way sinners we have all fall short and a sinner come and fall short of the glory of God. So what we deserve is the consequence of our sin. But did he sin? The Bible said he was tested in all points as we are but what? Yet without sin. But still yet he went to the cross not for himself but for sinners like you and me. So consider you when you go through your, your trials, your crucibles, your tests, your tribulation. Consider Jesus and why he went to the cross. If it was only you, if it was only me, it was one, he would have gone to the cross. But the truth was, it was one. It was one, beloved. Yes, yes, yes. what do you mean one? Yes, it was one. Out of all the billions of worlds and universe that Jesus created that is inhabited by the unfallen world only one fell this earth and he for the one bless the name so the righteousness slash right doing of God a gift of God revealed in the faith of Jesus it is what makes man right with God. You didn't get that, beloved. The right doing of God is what brings man back into a relationship with God. You see, when Adam sinned, man was separated from God. Yes, separated. The Bible said Jesus came to seek and to save that which was what? Lost. So Adam was lost when he sinned. But because there was a savior before he sinned. This wasn't just a moment of planning, but before the foundation of the world, Jesus was the lamb slain. So when there was sin from Adam, immediately there was a savior. And so the life that allowed Adam to continue to live was a life borrowed on the rise. It was the life of Jesus promised that gave Adam, not just Adam, but the entire race that came from the loins of Adam, life. So every human being benefited who was born into this world from that life. Are you listening to me? So it was as a result of the right doing of God, a gift of God, which was revealed in the faith of Jesus that makes man right again, brought in him, reconciled him unto God again. Romans 3, 21 to 31 gives a little more insight on this, this righteousness of God. Romans 3, 21 to 31, and you could follow in your Bibles with me, beloved. Romans 3, verses 21 to 31. Here Paul describes his righteousness. He says, even the righteousness, and by the way, righteousness is right doing. Simple right doing. Even in this right doing, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of who? Faith, by faith of who? By faith of Jesus Christ unto how many? And upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, beloved. When Jesus died, he didn't die for those who will eventually believe or those who believe. He died for all humanity. See, Adam was an unbeliever when Jesus decided to step in for him. Are you listening to me? He wasn't a believer when Jesus decided to be a sin bearer. He was a believer before that, but then when he disobeyed God, he expressed unbelief. God said, if the tree that is in the middle of God, do not eat of it. For the day that you eat your rock, you shall surely die. The fact that they went to eat of it is believing. It means that they didn't believe God. They didn't trust God. They didn't have confidence in God. 
And so as a result, there was separation from God. Here it is now saying in the word of God that there is really no difference. For all, we are all under sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24 says, being justified freely by his grace to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, a satisfier, that's what the word means, a propitiation through faith in Jesus' blood to now declare my righteousness? To declare my righteousness? Your righteousness? Is, it, is this what Jesus died for to declare your righteousness? No. Or my righteousness? Because all righteousness, put it all together, is still to rise. The Bible of fact, the pen of inspiration says, if all that men can consider to be virtuous, to present this before heaven as something to plead on their behalf, the angel considered that as treason. Treason. How dare you consider whatever you do apart from God to be righteous. You are already condemned. The law can't do nothing to save you. It only can point out your condemnation, your sin that has violated the law. And all you deserve, and all I deserve, is death. So here, in this text, God has set forth to be a propitiation, a satisfier through faith in his blood, in Jesus' blood, now to declare Jesus' righteousness for the remissions of sin that are past through the forbearance of God. And verse 26 continues to say, to declare, I say, at this time, which is not just then, but also now, at this time, he is right doing. And we just look at his right doing at length. His suffering. The despising of the shame, the mockery, the scourge, and the final suffering upon the cross. That is the righteousness he's talking about. A self-sacrificing righteousness. A righteousness that didn't consider itself even though flesh came up and said, Father, if this were possible, let this come pass for me. But not my will, but thy will be done. Why? Because he was looking down in time. That he knew there was no other way to save humanity but sacrificing himself. Are you listening to me? So this kind of righteousness is self-sacrificing. Are you willing to sacrifice for Jesus? What have you sacrificed? What have I sacrificed for Jesus? Are you willing to give up something for Jesus? We see that he gave up all of what are you willing to sacrifice for him? Paul continued to say, I declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, his self-sacrificing love, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believe in Jesus. Verse 27 says, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Meaning the law of obedience? Nay, but by the law of faith. You see, it was not our obedience that freed us from the condemnation of sin. It was not our obedience that gave us a second chance to life. It was not our right doing, but it was Christ. And this was an act of Faithfulness to God his Father. So this is why Paul is saying it was not of the law, but the law witnessed it and testified of it, agreed with it, because it was in sync with the law. Are you listening to me? So because this is not of an earning of works, meaning there's nothing you can do to earn God's grace because you're doing already God's law and all you deserve is that. So any doing is a response to what he has done for you. Are you listening to me? So this is why faith becomes essential. Because first we must believe in what he has done and believe that what he has done has set us free from the condemnation of the law. What he has done has paid our debt, our penalty. What he has done has forgiven us. It 
has reconciled us to God. So we are called to believe this. And in believing everything that we now come to the world is a response of gratitude. Are you listening to me? So we are accounted right when we believe in what he has already accomplished. Before he was, let's continue looking at what the word says. So where is boasting? It is excluded by what law? Of works? Name. But by the law of faith. In other words, the faith of Jesus. Therefore, we process conclude that a man is not made right, justified by faith. No, let me read this again. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified or made right by faith without the deeds of the law. Before you come to, to any form of obedience, the, the word of God said, you only can be made right with God by believing and having trust and confidence in what Jesus already accomplished. Before you actually do anything. So therefore you can't boast when you start doing anything. You see, you do because of what he already did. Did you catch that? You see, you can't come to do unless he already did. Because the only thing you could do was succumb to the consequence of the law. Because we are already violated. So all I'm doing right now is to, in all ways, a response to what he has already done. There's just no value or estimation in what I'm not doing. I don't praise or value or estimate myself or what I do. Any ministry, preaching, teaching, singing, any literature, anything that I do here, it is a response. The moment I start valuing this, the Bible says that the doing is excluded. See, I'm not accounted righteous because of what I do. I'm accounted righteous because of who I believe in. Amen. Amen. Are you listening to me? Many may say, but, but what about the obedience of the law? You see, you and I are violators. You see, because we are violators, there is nothing we can do to correct the violation. You didn't get that. There is nothing we can do again to correct the violation. That's why he had to come and do. And that doing involved dying. See, if we were to, 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 to really satisfy the demands of the law, then we would have died and stayed dead. And by the way, it's not just a sleep death where you go to bed and never wake up. No, you must experience the wrath of God. Jesus experienced the wrath of God. The Bible says he tread the wine press and faced the fierceness of God Almighty. So what we were supposed to get, he received. Are you listening to me? So Paul is saying clearly. Therefore, we conclude that a man is not justified, made righteous. The word justify here means made righteous. A man is, by the way, justified by faith without the deeds of the law. In other words, he is made righteous without, before he does anything. It starts with your faith. But your faith must testify of God's goodness through your works. Did you get that? Your faith does not exclude you from good works. If you are truly justified by faith, then why is it not seen in your life? In your good works, in your kindness, in your patience, in your forgiveness. In your obedience to God's requirement. Or why is that your faith showing that you love Jesus through your obedience? You so say your obedience does not save you, beloved. Your obedience does not save you. Your obedience is the fruit of your faith. So you lost. Your obedience is an outcome of an already working inward faith. Amen. That is what God is evaluating you on. None of the things you do, otherwise some of us could trick him. That's why when he comes and when he says the prayer from you, he says, oh, no, 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 I have done all marvelous works in thy name. How many pastors, devil, how many done this, this ministry, that ministry? And he said, depart from me because I don't see me in you. I don't know you. Because who is in you is not me. 
Are we getting the gist, beloved? Why Paul is urging us not to focus on obedience as important as obedience is. It does justify us. We are justified, justified by faith alone. Works obedience is an outcome or a fruit of an already existing faith. God looks at what we believe, how we believe, how much we believe. Because once we believe, it will be made manifest in our actions. There's no way we can say we are justified by faith, but still it go by the brother and sister and see them hungry and destitute of food and say, be blessed and then leave with a pockets full of money. No way! That's dead faith, beloved. Not a justified faith, but a disingenuous faith. And God knows that faith too. But it doesn't change the fact that we are justified by faith in an already existing work of Jesus Christ, which is actually the faith of Jesus Christ. Let us continue the word. The word continues to say, Is the God of the Jews, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Same way all of us are saved. No different way. You are not saved this way and I saved that way. Abraham saved this way, but John saved this that way. No, all are saved by faith. This is why when you go into the book of Hebrews, you say, by faith, Enoch, by faith, Noah, by faith. All of them were saved by faith and their faith produced good works. But they never place value and estimation on their works. They actually place value on the works of Jesus. Say amen. amen. We are called to do the same. And the text comes conclude by saying, do we then make void the law through faith? The Bible said, God forbid. We establish the law, but we only can establish it by faith. Amen. No other way, beloved. So faith is also righteousness. Abraham received the promise through the righteousness of faith in Romans 4, 2, 3, and 13. For if Abraham was justified by works, he had whereof to glory, but not before God. For what said the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. For the promise that he should be the hearer of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of God. So here we are seeing faith is also described as righteousness. For your faith in God is a righteousness shown by you revealing that you trust God because of what he has already accomplished. So God's righteous act invokes a righteous response. But some may not have that response. So how are we to see the faith of Jesus as mentioned in Revelation 14, 12? How are we supposed to see that? Now the scripture text talks about here is the patience of the sinners. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now Adventists love that text. And they give them to our Protestant Sunday keeping brothers and sisters and see, see? Yes, faith is important, but see, commandment of God. But do we understand this passage of scripture. Two class of people being described in the third angel's message. One receiving and bearing the mark of the beast and the other keeping the commandments of God and having the faith of Jesus. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying in verse 13, Unto me, right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, set the spirit that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Those are faithful works, beloved. You see, the Bible can talk about your works then after you depart from the earth because your works were anchored already in the faith of Jesus. So when he talks about rewarding you, it's according to what he has done for you and you're responding to it. So you're rewarded really according to grace. 
Insights from Manuscript 24, 1888, paragraph 42 to 44 on the faith of Jesus. Here, the pen of inspiration describes a little more about this faith of Jesus. So the faith of Jesus has been overlooked, he said, and treated in an indifferent, careless manner. It has not occupied the prominent position in which it was revealed to John. Faith in Christ as a sinner's only hope has been largely left out. Not only the discourse, not only of the discourse is given, but of the religious experience of very many who claim to believe the third angel's message. The third angel's message is the proclamation of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. The commandments of God have been proclaimed, but the faith of Jesus Christ has not been proclaimed by Seventh-day Adventists as of equal importance. The law and the gospel going hand in hand. I cannot find language to express this subject in its fullness, the pen of inspiration says. The faith of Jesus, she says, it is taught of, but not understood. What constitutes the faith of Jesus that belongs to the third angel's message, she asks? Jesus, and she's now answering it, Jesus becoming our sin bearer, that he might become our sin pardoning savior. He was treated as we deserve to be treated. He came to our world and took our sins that we might take his righteousness. Faith in the ability of Christ to save us amply and fully and entirely is the faith of Jesus. His ability to save us amply and I save us from everything. The power of sin. His ability to save us from its power. To free us from the consequence. By the way, he already paid the penalty, so he removed the consequence, the condemnation from us, so that we can freely come to him. He has reconciled us before we even got involved in the picture through the death of his son. The Bible says, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled by the death of his son, much more we shall be saved by his life. She continued to say, the only safety for the Israelites was blood upon the doorpost. God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. All other devices for safety would be without avail. No matter what we do in blood, and if it's not anchored in the faith of Jesus, then it's to no Regardless of God good or not, regardless of what kind of ministry it is, if it is not anchored in believing what Jesus has accomplished for you as a sin there, then it is to no avail. Nothing but the blood on the doorpost would bar the way that the angel of death should not enter. There is salvation for the sinner in the blood of Jesus Christ alone, which cleanses from all sin. The man with a cultivated intellect may have vast stores of knowledge. He may engage in theological speculations. He may be great and honored. He may be a great and honored, honored man and be considered the, the repository of knowledge. But unless he has a saving knowledge of Christ crucified for him and by faith lays hold of the righteousness of Christ, he is lost. Christ was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Saved by the blood of Jesus Christ will be our only hope for time and a song throughout eternity. Amen. How much are we valuing the death of Christ for our sins? How much are we surveying the cross of Calvary? We only run to Jesus when we have problems and when we need him for something. But, but beloved, we are shown here from the pen of inspiration that our faith must be anchored in what he already accomplished, which surrounds his death for us. We must constantly contemplate the cross of Calvary. The book Lessons on Faith by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, page 24, talks a little about how much we don't value this faith. Many people pray, Mr. Wagner says, but do not know it is, it is, but do not know it is will of the Lord, the will of the Lord that they should have what they pray for. 
and so do not know whether they can certainly claim it. They are all at sea as to whether their prayers are answered or not. The Lord does not want anybody to move uncertainly. Therefore, he has given his word, which thoroughly furnishes everyone unto all the works, and by which are given all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And anyone who seeks the, in the word of God the things which God has there provided for all, and upon that specific word prays for that thing, thus asking God according to the plainly expressed will of God, knows that his prayers is heard, and that he has the things for which he prays. Beloved, we have not gone to God about His promises. We have not consulted God on many of our decisions. We make these decisions and they blow up in our face, then we run to God to rescue us. We think we know. There are sometimes we are challenged when we're at that fork in the road and we don't know to go left or right. The Bible says, go to God because everything is right here. The whole issue of life is right here. Show me, Lord, where I must go. Show me, Lord, thy will for me. And it says, when you put it to him and his word and trust with the results of his word, you can claim it in Jesus' name. As I close. The issue is about the word of Jesus. The issue is about what he has already accomplished. The issue is about surveying the price he paid. And so because it's all about what he has already done, how he has already reconciled, how he has already redeemed us, how he is seeking now to transform the life, not just from re re saving us from the condemnation of the law, but he wants to save us from the power of sin in our lives. So we need to now trust based on what he did. Look how far he has gone, how much he has sacrificed should be enough to convince us how much he loves us and cares for us. We don't need no other evidence. It is clear how much he loves. He's not only our past life and sins against us. He's not really been held against Jesus Christ. He said, come to me all that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Beloved, there was a little girl who was listening in on her parents' conversation, her mother and her father as they discussed her sick brother who had seemingly a brain tumor. And she listened and she overheard her father talking about how much it is so expensive to get him the care and the help that he needed. And the father said, only a miracle can save him. The little girl hearing the words of her father, trusting that what he said is so, went to her little piggy bank and she broke her piggy bank all that she saved a dollar and eight cents she grabbed up this money believing and trusting in what her father said that that word if she was able to, to, to take what she believed to, to, to get what she needed for her brother she would accomplish that miracle she took that money all that she had sacrificed it to the pharmacy and she knocked on the, the, the counter. The pharmacist was engaged with a conversation with his brother and they didn't hear when she knocked and she took one of the pens and knocked a little louder. And she was so sure they could already see her over the counter and when they saw her, they, little girl, how can we help you? How can I help you? And she said, sir, I'm here because my brother is sick. 
they, my, my parents don't have the money to, 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 to get him help, but, but I'm here to purchase him a miracle. about what about miracle we, we, we don't sell miracles here this is a pharmacy we have drugs and so on and she said but my dad he said it he said if we if we, if we could get a miracle it would save him so I would sacrifice all of my savings to purchase him a miracle his brother who was conversating with the pharmacist heard the little girl's story and rush around the counter and leaned over to this little girl and said, what is going on with your brother? And she said, I, I heard mom and dad said he has something in his brain and we don't have the money to get him the medical help he needs. And so I think when daddy said, only a miracle could save him, I think I could purchase this miracle. So I emptied my savings. I only have a dollar and eight cents and I'm here to buy him a miracle. Literally, this little girl knew that this man that was listening was a neurosurgeon. Amen. He heard the story of this child. Heart melted and decided, take me to your brother. Take me to your parents. And beloved, by that miracle, the surgeon was able to cure this son. Beloved, what I'm here to say to you today is the miracle that was purchased for us was the blood of Jesus paying for our sins, freeing us from the condemnation of the law, forgiving us, reconciling us to God. That was the miracle. He purchased us a second chance with his blood. And so today, beloved, we are called to have faith in the faithfulness of Jesus. If you want to exercise that faith today, will you stand with me as we pray? Sinful practices. 
so that we can now manifest the righteousness of Jesus in our lives. A life of now selflessness. A life that will sacrifice everything to Jesus and for Jesus. A life that loves not its life unto the death. Continue to pour your blood, your righteousness, your merits upon our hearts. Come!